Welcome back to another Q&A video. Post your questions down below and let's get started. Hey Alex, do you think progressive overload and isolation exercise is necessary? Yes. This is one of the main reasons why these exercises get a bad rep. Guys are not adding weights year to year. They're doing the same 20 pound dumbbells on their curls, the same freaking numbers on the tricep pushdown. And the same thing for the band face bowls and all the other accessories that exist. If you want to maximize the results, progressive overload must be induced on all the exercises, not just the compound lifts. Of course, that is number one. So bench press takes priority over something like a fucking chest fly. And in fact, you don't even need to do chest flies, but I digress. If you're going to be doing an isolation exercise, improve the performance if you know you're capable of doing it. So if you were supposed to do three sets of 8 to 12 and eventually you get 12, 12, 12, well, now it's time to move on to the next weight. Don't repeat the same fucking number every single workout. This is all too common and it explains why a lot of guys are not getting the results that they want from exercises that actually do work. Same thing for skull crushers and other effective uh, movements like that that do give you carryover and aid in the um, bodybuilding process for just getting jacked. If you want to get the best results, progressive overload must be induced on absolutely everything. That said, am I going to say that's necessary, that's mandatory? No, because some would argue that you can get jacked enough just doing the compounds. And therefore, the isolation is just fluff. But the way that I see it, it's important. And you have to get stronger at them. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on weighted pull-ups with bands making the top of the movement exceedingly hard for one-arm pull-up training? I think it's a fantastic idea. You're modifying the strength curve in a way that is quite specific to the one-arm pull-up. Like, I found that the lockout portion is so freaking challenging. A lot of guys say that the bottom is the hardest. And yeah, that typically is the case for most people. But the sticking point is still very tough at the top. I'm talking like the maximum lockout. When your arm is really bent past 90 degrees, it's not easy whatsoever. And the way that I see it, weighted pull-ups will already help in building up that one-arm pull-up strength, right? Automatically. Like if you do 70% of your body weight, you can be pretty jacked and strong to be able to do it. Um, and if you add bands on top of it, yeah, it's specific training. It's another exercise that overrides the biological law of accommodation. And of course, it'll help you out. You're going to get very good at the top positions. So when you go do your isometrics, your negatives and all that, the carryover will be there. So I definitely say, give this a shot. Your shoulders look really good. Are you doing any lateral raises or just overhead press variations? No lateral raises. I haven't done that in a very long time. Would it be optimal to include them? Absolutely. I probably should. But I feel that my delts are going just fine with the overhead press, the rear delt flies, and the band face pulls. Honestly, those are my main exercises that I do. In addition to bench press, weighted dips, and push-ups and stuff like that. But I don't do a lot of side laterals. And if I go back years ago when I was doing a lot of that, like, I'll say my shoulders look better now. But that, like I said, doesn't mean that it's optimal what I'm doing. I'm just saying, like, for most naturals, you're not going to have that fucking 3D pop anyway in a completely relaxed state. And it's actually the rear delts that contribute a lot to the 3D appearance anyway. So it's like, I'd rather just focus on that personally. Like, to me, it's, it's more worth it to do a band face bowl or a delt fly than a side lateral. And the fact that my shoulders still look fine. But... Yeah, I'm going to tell you to keep doing that for sure. And in Naturally Enhanced, I show you different ways of building up the side delts. Uh, lateral raises being one of them, strict and power version, in addition to uh, scarecrows and crucifix holds and all kinds of different movements like that. You, Alex, is it bad if my back bends a little in the last few reps and I overhead press, doesn't hurt after? Uh, which part of the back? And what's the degree of it, right? If you're bending at the lower back like this, and then you're just leaning back this way, Get ready for Snap City at some point in your training career. And you're ingraining a false moon pattern. You're going to keep doing that every single time it gets heavy. I don't recommend it. And of course, you're going to do that, uh, wear a belt. But if it's just the upper back, you know, kind of turning into an incline bench, but you're not compromising the lower back, you're not hyperextending in a negative way, I don't really see a huge issue with it. Some guys believe you have to be perfectly upright. No, you don't. <laughs> just uh, there's a way to lean back in a way that's not so dangerous, okay? The way that I see it, just don't hyperextend the lower back and you're good to go. But you do what you want, man. Uh, you, I can also tell you, just do it 100% strict every single time. Maybe get on some Z presses. That'll teach you how to really overhead press with strict form. Or just do it sitting down without the back pad. Or with a back pad, whatever. My general answer is, if it's upper back, not a big deal. If it's lower, change what you're doing. Hey, Alex, do you recommend doing your hybrid program after the novice program? No, I do not. That system was designed for lifters who are intermediate in one part of their body, but it's imbalanced. So let's say you already got a 225 for five bench and you can't make linear gains on that anymore. But you notice that your squat and dead are much lower, maybe because you ran an upper body program in the past, right? Well, in that case, you're better off running the hybrid system. This way you can still do a different method for the upper body, 
but you got the linear progression nailed for the lower body. See how that makes sense? So if you're passing off a stage, the hybrid program is no longer appropriate for you. You get it? Because now everything is maximized. Now, if you were to combine both elements of the hybrid system into just one, then it would work. What I'm saying is take both the templates and combine it into one. This way you got the intermediate progression for upper body and lower body. But I'm not going to do that for you. You got to figure out how to do it yourself. But in that case, it would work. Otherwise, uh, no, you definitely want to move on to a straight on intermediate routine. He asked with a concurrent routine, do you have an app to track your calories or how do you do the sets and reps and wait for every exercise? Love your content. Keep up the good work. You changed my life. Thank you. Well, thank you too, man. I'm honored to hear that. So keep crushing those gains and I'll do my best to keep giving you this advice. All right. So no, I don't use an app. Never have. It's not really a thing that I like doing. In fact, I don't like tracking on my phone. I like the old school way. Notebook. Writing it down. And that's what I used to do back in the day. I would bring a fucking notebook to the gym. Over here, it's a lot easier to track. I can do it on my computer as well. Or just on a little notebook here. But it's like, I don't, I'm not a big fan of apps. But if that's what you like, if that's what you prefer, go ahead and do so. Um, I can't say I have any at the top of my, uh, my mind, you know. I know Greg Knuckles is associated with a good one. And there's a bunch of them that exist for serious lifters. So if anybody has some advice, put it in the comment section. I'm just not familiar with that type of world. Uh, but what I can say is in terms of tracking progress, notebook, bro. Workout logs, check out the full video I made on it, you know. Track all your PRs for certain exercises, and as you rotate through them, just scroll back the pages and see what those uh, PRs were, right? And then just beat them. So if a month ago you did 315 for five on the bench press, and now you finally got it back into your rotation, well, now try getting 315 for six. That's what you know you have to hit based on the previous PR that's been written in your notebook. You can either keep yourself accountable by looking at the PRs that have been written, or you do it up here, all mental. And I've done that for a very long time as well. Although I'll say that my best gains is always when I write it all down because now you're 100% accountable and there's really no excuses not to be getting PRs. It's all there in front of your face and you don't forget either, which is always nice. And you could see where you're fucking up. Maybe you overdid on the volume, maybe you overdid on the intensity and maybe you could see which exercises give you the most carryover because it's all written down, see? So no, I don't have any apps, but that's my advice. Do you think that the elevated reverse push-ups on a chair is a good rear delt isolation move if you're a calisthenics athlete? Will those reverse push-ups and ring face pulls take care of my posture, scapula, and rear delt size? Well, I don't really have uh, much experience with that particular movement, but uh, the ring face pulls are definitely good. And isolation exercise in general for the rear delts are what you should be doing no matter what type of athlete you are. So if you find that to be very effective and your gains are coming along just fine, you notice that it enhances your posture, keep doing it. I can't say much about something I haven't experienced, right? So to me, that's a very new lift. I'm just being honest with you. But I like the fact that you're thinking about this. Rather than just being one of these guys that only does pull-ups, then you're wondering what the fuck happened to your rear delts, you know? Especially if you're doing a lot more pushing volume in comparison, right? So to me, it's a fantastic idea. You definitely want to isolate. You can also do it with bands instead of calisthenics. That works too. Like, my personal recommendation would be to get some cheap bands and just do your band face pulls at home. Problem solved. Or rear delt flies, bro. You don't need a lot of weight for that. So if you don't want to use the rings or whatever, I think this is a more convenient way of setting it up at home in particular, right? Or just in general, like it's faster to do that than fucking ring uh, red delt stuff. And the, the, the push-up thing, I don't know how effective that is, bro. Can't give you a clear answer on that, but uh, definitely maximize programming, which includes isolations and just accessories to refine these little weak areas. Keep doing what you're doing for sure. How would you modify naturally enhanced if a person's goals were purely muscle gain? Would you still recommend a max effort day? And if so, would you recommend any modifications? I would still recommend the volume and intensity setup just if you don't care really about getting like the, the best strength gains possible, you don't have to do the max effort method. You could just do a one peak set followed by the back off and you'd be fine with that. Or you could just use a lower percentage in general. So don't go above 90%, problem solved. Maybe cap it at 80, 85 if you really want to go heavy. But I would just say uh, one day is going to be heavier, one day is going to be lighter, obviously. But it's not going to be balls to the wall, absolutely extreme, like you would in the classic setup. So that's how I would do it if your goals were like, 100% muscle gain, even though you can't really do that in a sense. It's just you're not maximizing the strength training factors of things, if that makes sense. You're like you're not doing max effort method. You're not doing like three by threes. Uh, maybe you're sticking to more of a hybrid type setup with the five by fives or more back off sets in general, more ramping sets with higher lows. Like basically look at the chapter where I talk about sets and reps, right? Basically look at the section where I talk about sets and reps and use the highest amount that's been listed for intensity days specifically. So roll with those and then volume could be whatever you choose to it could be on the higher side, moderate side, whatever. Um, just don't go balls to the wall for intensity. 
And that's how you would do it if you're not shooting for maximum strength gains. Could you get big arms with only cable exercises? Are you talking about only doing cable isolations? Um, if so, I would say yes. Now, if you're talking about doing exclusively cables and nothing else, which includes compound movements, I would say it's possible, but maybe not realistic or it's something that most guys are not going to do. And maybe you should just not even think about this, you know, like what's your routine? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve here? I have no idea. Like this is a very, it depends on so many factors. All I will say is that let's say you do uh, calisthenics or weighted calisthenics. And then for isolations, you do cable curls, cable tricep extensions, your cable face pulls lap pull downs, you do all that stuff, right? Then yeah, you're gonna get stupid jacked. Are you getting stronger at the cable machine? Let's say the stack is 200 pounds, right? You start at 100, okay, over time you get 200, yeah. Muscle gains will occur. And it'll be the same for a hammer strength machine or any other machine for that matter. As long as you're getting stronger, performance is increasing over time, you will get muscular. That's all I can really say. What do you do if you try a new PR on a max effort lift and fail? You just move on, maybe try next time, or you rethink your programming. I would say you can either rethink your programming or you move on. Um, I would not try to reattempt the same exercise. It just, you're gonna fail it again. Like the reason why people fail in the first place, if they're constantly doing max effort work is that you're doing the same exercise all the time. Like you'll find that if you change up the variations constantly, you don't really get many plateaus. Or for something very drastic, again, the PRs are pretty much guaranteed. It's how many PRs you accumulate on a variety of exercises that really raise your competition lift in one shot. So to me, you should use more variations if that's happening. And of course, don't milk it for as long as you think you could. So if you've been doing it every two weeks and you notice that sometimes it's hit or miss, then just fuck it. Just do rotation every single week, problem solved. And in my experience, the times where I did fail a lift, it's when I got too greedy. I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to go for this lift again. But let's say you do fail it for whatever, even if your programming was good, then yeah, you could recalibrate, look at the variables. Maybe you weren't sleeping enough, eating properly. Maybe your volume and intensity was not managed uh, the correct way. That's why, like I'm going back to the previous question, writing things down is a great idea. This way you're held accountable. But I would say, yeah, if you fail the exercise, just rotate it through, do another uh, wave of special movements that you know will give you carryover, then try again, try a month later, whatever. But the worst thing you can do is keep hammering it over and over again, at least in my opinion and experience. What do you think about managing volume and intensity for box watching? I was programming a way of doing one day, four to six reps, and then doing eight to 10 on the other day. Okay. In terms of gains, in terms of effectiveness, this is a very, very, very good idea. It goes back to that question about naturally enhanced. What if you don't want to do max effort training? This would kind of be the substitute if that makes sense, right? Or one day you're still doing lower repetitions, the other one's higher, but it's not like balls to wall. You know what I'm saying? Um, that said, for my novice program, this is not what I advise. It's a linear progression system that has you emphasizing the same sets and reps. So although this would work on my routine, it absolutely would, it's not what I'm telling you to do. Otherwise, there would be a novice concurrent routine for that. And it would likely be, if you're doing three times a week, heavy, light, medium, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or it could be twice a week, heavy and then volume in the way that you described, but not doing true max effort work. So in terms of results, yeah, it's effective. I can't say anything bad about it. You will get gains. I promise you that. But it's not what's included in my knowledge program. So if you want to do it, if you want to try it out, be my guest. But it's a different system. Yeah, Alex, any tips for simulating dumbbell work for a home gym? All I have is barbell and bands. Thanks. You know what, bro? I'm going to make a full video on this. You brought it to my attention, and I think it would help out a lot of people. Not just for those who have a home gym, but maybe the dumbbells in your gym aren't quite the best, you know? They're very poor quality or the jumps are not appropriate either. Or you want a different way of spicing up your training in a unilateral fashion, if that makes sense. So I'll definitely make a video on this. I'm going to show you some creative ways of doing one arm work and just stuff that does not include a barbell. Some creative ideas here. Okay. So we'll definitely look out for that type of content. Hey Alex, what do you think about boxing and fitness alternating six times a week, three times boxing, three times fitness. Okay. I think it's a very, very good routine, but you're going to have to pay extreme attention to your recovery. This can cause you to overreach quite easily. Like you're gonna have to sleep very well and probably even a calorie surplus because you're really pushing the limit here. Like let's say you're doing full body Monday, Wednesday, Friday, heavy light, medium, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, boxing rounds, right? That basically means you have no days off except for your Sunday and you're constantly going at it and your recovery is never 100% in the first place. So it will be more challenging, but it can still be done obviously. Or if you're doing boxing at the end of every workout, but I don't think that's what you're talking about here, right? You're, you're saying six days a week, but three is lifting, three is boxing. Like, it's great. But I think for better recovery, 
You could do twice a week fitness and then three times boxing, or you could do three times fitness, two times boxing, or you do two fitness, two boxing. Those are the options, my friend. So try it out, but please pay attention to your sleep and nutrition and just the programming in general. Like this has to be nailed perfectly. Since it's been many years since your knowledge program, what would you change with all of your new knowledge? Well, if you have questions about that, I'm always talking about it in my weekly Q and A's. And I had some guys ask me stuff like that today, okay? So all that is always being covered. And also there's a Q and A section and there's a big thread, like a huge comment section. I'm always checking it out, seeing what the feedback is and refining things, you know? And there have been a little bit of changes over the years, actually. If you, if you look at the page, if you look at what's been implemented, there have been some changes. Now, would I modify some things and I was programmed these days? Maybe, but it wouldn't be like major changes in the way. Like the template would still remain. It would just be some alternatives, you know? Like, you know, maybe doing a free squat instead of a box squat or doing it or making the front squats a mandatory part of the program once you hit certain numbers. Maybe replacing the stiff-legged deadlifts for reverse hypers. And, you know, maybe introducing grease and groove as a mandatory part as well. And then structuring in a detailed cardio and neck program at the same time. Like, it would just be additional shit. In addition to swapping out stuff that's that already works. But you're just changing the template slightly. So, the program itself is still fantastic. But if I want to change things up, I don't think it would be for that routine specifically. It would need to be a brand new system that emphasizes um, different methods and exercises. Yeah, Alex, what do you think about a short guy at 5'6 competing in strongman? Is there a point... Or will I get smoke from the bigger guys because they have bigger strength potential? Thanks. You probably will get smoke, but does that really matter? You're probably not going to be the best of the best anyway, right? But you like strongman, don't you? It's a sport that appeals to you, the strength objectives, everything about it. It's like, yeah, this is fucking cool. In that case, who cares if you're not going to be the best? You can be the best version of you. You may not win first place. You may not be the ultimate competitor, but maybe it's not about the others. Maybe it's just about fulfilling what you really want. And to me, it sounds like it's a sport that intrigues you. And also consider the fact there's a, um, a lightweight class for strongman too. I think it's a 175 class. I know uh, Kale Beck does that and he's 5'7", I believe. So you can give that a shot. Just be the best 175 strongman you could possibly be. And if other guys smoke you, then so fucking be it, bro. At least you gave it your best. And you're still going to get jacked. You're still going to get strong. You're still going to be better than most people who never did strongman. It's just that you don't have the anthropometry advantage. And also, I believe uh, there was a guy in strongman history who was about that height and he was crushing it. He was getting like crazy, crazy elite numbers. One of my subscribers had given me a reference to him. I just don't remember what the fuck his name was, but uh, if anybody recalls who that guy is, let me know. So that's it. Last question of the week. Hey Alex, how can I get stronger at T-bar rolls? Can only do six place for reps. Thanks. Well, six place for reps is pretty good, man. So keep up the great work. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is to use concurrent periodization. So have a volume day and intensity or do a heavy light medium and just change the variations of the T-bar row. So maybe one workout, it could be the really big plates. Another workout, it could be the super tiny plates. You can also mix in cheat reps with strict form. And then you can do different attachments on the T-bar row itself. Then you can throw in the Meadows row, which is still done in that station, right? So one arm at a time using the edge of the, the barbell, the sleeves basically. And you can do the one arm T-bar row. So that'll help you out as well. It's going to help give you that carryover. Finally, I would just tell you to get stronger at most free weighted rows. Like get your barbell row up in strength, get your pen lay row up, even uh, raise your dumbbell strength. All of them will have really good carryover to one another. The key is to mimic the joint angles that you would experience in the T-bar row. And that's all there really is to it. One day heavy, one day volume, rotate special exercises like I'm always talking about. You'll be crushing seven plates in no time. Oh, and also consider wearing straps if you haven't already. I know it's not as important with the T-bar, but still you'll be able to lift more weight. So that's my advice, man. Hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A video. Got more awesome content on the way, and I'll see you next week.